China is committed to wetland conservation. It has built over 600 wetland nature reserves and more than 1,600 wetland parks. It's home to 64 wetlands of international importance. During the ongoing COP14, China, a co-host, has appealed to the world to manage wetlands sustainably to tackle climate change and protect biodiversity. So why are wetlands so important? Let's talk to Professor Stephen Christoph Mabley from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. In terms of humans, well, you know, we wouldn't, I guess we wouldn't be here without wetlands because we rely on water for drinking. We rely, rely on it for irrigation and rice is a wetland plant and it's a staple food crop of more than half the world's populations. In terms of bio, biodiversity, two things really. Wetlands are hotspots for biodiversity. They have a very rich biological sets of communities, particularly for fish. But at the same time, it's the system, the realm, if you consider fresh waters versus oceans versus the land, it's the realm with the greatest loss of species in any of these different realms. It's suffered the most in, in the most recent years and is continuing to suffer. So, Professor, you have mentioned before that human activities in the climate change are probably the main threats to the wetlands. What have we done to mitigate its suffering and what should we do to protect our wetlands? You asked me about mitigation. So, talking about nutrients, first of all, inputs of nutrients to wetlands are starting to be reduced. Wastewater treatment works have installed better technology to remove particularly phosphorus, partially nitrogen. There's a move to reduce dependence on fossil fuels um, and use other technologies. And, and China is one of the leaders in this, in, in using renewable resources and uh, photovol photovoltaic sources. And well, this is COP27, but it's unclear really if we're making progress, but are we making progress fast enough to prevent, for example, this 1.5 degree increase in average air temperature globally, which is regarded as a potential tipping point. So other mitigation things, well, I mentioned a couple of times national and international le legislation that's also mitigated threats such as from peat mining, from atmospheric emissions leading to acid rain. So we can't mitigate climate change locally. And each individual person can take some responsibility not to waste energy um, and to recycle things. But 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 it's a, a really because it's global, it's a, a national and international thing. Yes, the small things make big change. Professor, you have been working closely with Chinese scholars and experts in ecologic related fields. After more than 20 years, can you share with us your overall impression of Chinese scientific research environment? When I visited in 1999, the facilities in institutes and universities appeared rather basic compared to what they were like in, 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 in Europe and America at the time. But since then, there's been an absolutely incredible and remarkable change. There's been a big investment in science by the government, which is very rightly, cleverly recognised the importance of that to, to, to a country. And this has been bolstered, really, with these exchanges between uh, young scientists in China visiting Europe, USA, Japan, and learning the scientific technique and nowadays, when you look at publications, at least in my area of science, China is a major international player, publishing in, in all the top journals. So I think it's really been quite remarkable about how, how China has managed to, in really 20 years, come from you know, a country which didn't do that much good science now to competing you know, globally with all the other major uh, science Paper, uh, science driven countries in, in the world.